now I'm going to say a short healing prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that the healing power of Christ, the blood of Jesus, might wash over each person, washing over their hearts, their minds, resting their minds in you, resting their hearts in you, healing, purifying, and sanctifying. In the name of Jesus, may you all be healed. In the name of Jesus, may you be liberated and in peace. And may God bless you. Hi, thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch the videos we've shared with you. And hopefully, you'll always learn something from us. Or the very strong, mandatory way. I command you, in the name of the victorious Christ, leave that person now. Ooh. For this video, again, I'd like to share something from the exorcist, Monsignor Stephen Rossetti, who recounted an event that he experienced during an exorcism that perfectly shows what the nature of demons is like, narcissist. He explained that he was in a difficult case, and they knew it would be a long and ugly battle. At one point, the exorcist demanded to know, how many demons are there? The demonic sarcastic response was, too many for you. As the demonic cohort weakened, Monsignor Rossetti was able to force them to reveal the names of all the leaders, plus the total number of demons there are, 856. He then demanded to know the names of the leaders, and it sounded like a who's who in hell. This was not going to be easy. The months went by, and little by one the demons, including the strongest ones, were being expelled in the name of Jesus. Eventually, Monsignor Rossetti and the team came to the demon ball he was forced to reveal that there were 679 demons left. The exorcist priests performed the rite again, and as always, the demons howled in agony. They were so weak at this point that the holy water burned them and the mere sight of the crucifix was agonizing. This tortured them. So Father Rossetti continued and ordered Baal to leave, and he pronounced his name with two syllables. But to his surprise, the demon firmly corrected him. It is Baal and pronounce it with one syllable. Later in the session, Ball corrected him again and said that his name is pronounced Ball. The exorcist acknowledged this was strange because the demon was in the middle of a pitched battle, screaming at the top of his lung and was about to be thrown back into hell. And yet, he was concentrating on how to pronounce his name. One of the lessons the exorcist took from this example is that demons are total narcissists, and the devil is the biggest narcissist of all. In hell, no one thinks of the good of another. It is pure self-focused and like Ball, the strange and irrational thought of an intellect succumbed to evil. The devil would sacrifice every demon under him in hell just for his own pleasure. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. By the way, just that action right there, just this action when you do it with reverence and piety, um, St. Athanasius, St. Cyprian of Carthage, uh, Tertullian, Felix Minucius, many of the early church fathers say when you make the sign of the cross with reverence and piety, you drive demons away from you. This, that's right here, this is actually an offensive weapon against demons. So let's do it again. Name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would also like to add something that was shared by another exorcist, Father Trucli, who spoke about the demon that specializes in attacking the family. For some of you who have watched the movie The Pope's Exorcist, you've probably heard of him, and he was also mentioned in the book of the Bible of Tobias, Asmodeus. From the Old Testament book, it is known that he is the demon who killed seven of Sarah's husbands and was chained in the desert by the angel Raphael. And in fact, Father Trucli confirms that this demon is present in many exorcisms. The priest recalled encounters with Asmodeus in the exorcisms of the late Father Gabriella Morth, whom he helped. I remember a young couple very close who wanted to get married. However, the woman had to undergo an exorcism to be released. Father Trucui said, During the exorcism, the demon became enraged and threatened Father Amorth because he wanted to prevent that marriage, otherwise he would kill the young woman. Obviously, it was the liar's threat, because in fact it did not happen. In this regard, the priest added that Asmodeus also seeks to attack the family through ideologies and lifestyles, as well as spreading individualistic thinking and the spread of divorce. Women think, if I stop liking my husband, I feel better divorcing, but they forget about the consequences for children and society. This anti-family mentality pleases Asmodeus. He knows that a man who is alone and without any point of reference, he is manipulable and unstable. The devil tries to destroy families because that is where Jesus grows, in the midst of the love of spouses and in the lives of their children. 
Jesus grows in the love of spouses. Jesus grows in the lives of children. And that is why the enemy attacks the family for so long. The devil does not love the family and he tries to destroy it by destroying the love that is there. The late Father Babylon, the exorcist from Padua, once shared this about the devil. The evil one is bothered by human love. In an exorcism, the devil told me angrily, I can't stand that they love each other. He was referring to a married couple. This made me reflect a lot on the fundamental role of marriage. The weapons we have against the devil are two. Prayer, that is, the relationship of love with God the Father and love for one's neighbor. Marriage is the sacrament of love. For this reason, the devil wants to destroy it. And many problems are overcome with an act of forgiveness, which is an increased love, which means bad news to the devil. The rite of exorcism is not something where you're meeting the devil in an hysterical way. What is required of, a, of an exorcist, if I read Canon 1172 correctly, is a person of balance, great experience, and great calm. A depth of calm that comes from deep spirituality so that you're not thrown off and getting upset. Now, certainly, the uh, demon that is possessing the person wants that more than anything else to have the priest lose, as I say, his cool. And no, you don't do that. That's, that would be giving in to the demon. So you need a person who is mature, very well practiced, and keeps the calm regardless of what happens. The uh, Jesuit who is in the Allen book there was an amazingly calm person. Here's somebody, you know, spitting in his face with abundant spittle, just saying, now, Lord Jesus, we are asking quietly, oh, yes, Jesus, let's you know. Never letting any of that cut to him at all. Just be keeping quiet, peaceful. This is a ritual. It is a sacramental of the Roman Catholic Church. As a result, it is something that requires devotion, quiet, peace, understanding, and it is a form of public prayer of petition, very much like the administration of the sacrament of baptism. It's just a takeoff of baptism. It's not a rebaptism, but it's a takeoff. It's an imitation of baptism because you have the rite of baptism is followed almost to a T, of course, elongated, and then ending with either the deprecative form Lord Jesus, we ask you please to, in the name of the uh, Holy Spirit who is here, to drive out the demon from this person, or the very strong, mandatory way, I command you, in the name of the victorious Christ, leave that person now. Mm. And you can imagine, you know, they don't want to leave. They don't want to leave. Uh, notice that you don't do things like this, you know, get mad. This is what you would not do, right? Well, I've had enough of this stuff coming out of you. Go back to hell where you belong. No, 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 no. Pious, balanced, calm, confident, knowing that the victory of Christ in the end will be victorious over this particular manifestation of the devil's power for what to show the power of jesus risen over everything even this father ripperger was once asked during a lecture a very simple question but a question he answered quite in detail how do demons look like according to him as he referenced the observation by saint thomas angels manifest in a way that's proper to the characteristics of their nature so there's some feature, some aspects to them that's going to be pronounced or be recognizable to give you a sense of who and what they are. And this is true not just of angels, but it's also true of demons. With demons, sometimes the facial features or certain things are exaggerated, and sometimes it has to do with the specific choice that they have. Which basically means that every demon that manifests is different. Their personalities are different because the essence of each angel is different from another. I mean, literally, 
their differences in personality and who and what they are, their natures, is as different as a grasshopper is from a cow. That's how drastic, their, their, their personalities are much, which come through in the manifestations, are much more marked and distinct than human personalities, which tend to be pretty soft in comparison. They're not, they don't have the um, types of um, uh, exaggerated, it's not quite the right word, but the more extreme um, characteristics. So that being said, every single one of them that manifests, manifests differently. And so you'll, you'll see them. And uh, once in a while, it, it, after you've worked with them for a while, you can just, in the, when the sessions begin, if you've been working with the person for a while and the demon is, because sometimes when the, before the session even begins, the demon's half manifested because he's, he's irritated and tore up that he's got to sit here and take this beating. So um, you can just look at the person and say, okay, he's ready to go. You know, and you know, just by the way that they're half, they can half manifest, they can manifest by degrees. So a lot of times when they fully manifest, that's when you'll see the person, like if it's a woman, she'll change into the figure. It looks like a man. People say, well, are, you know, are all demons males? Well, technically speaking, angels don't have gender. However, they do ma uh, uh, manifest as men. And the reason they manifest as men is because of the fact that uh, it has to do with the uh, leaving the impression, the image of strength, which is actually what angelic nature actually is. And so the only time that you tend to see demons manifesting as women is if uh, they're there to seduce. So as a general rule, they always uh, appear as men. And then the, um, those characteristics, can, as I mentioned, can be very different. So one of the guys I've dealt with in three separate cases is Beelzebub, which is another name for Satan. And Satan, when he appears under Satan or Lucifer or Beelzebub, he'll appear differently. But whenever he appears under Beelzebub, it always looks the same. And um, which is basically the jaw becomes extended, the top of the head narrows, the eyes become bloodshot, the face of the color of the person will instantaneously change completely red. And so there's that's that's when you see the um, so as soon as you see that change, you just say, okay, this is who it is. But it's again, it's by varying degrees. So how they manifest is determined based upon their characteristics. So each one is a little bit different. There are times in which they'll even appear as animals and things of that sort. And that's usually to emphasize a particular aspect of the possession um, or something in relationship to the case um, or some aspect of his personality. But that's generally how they do. So they, it's very different. Each one is very different. There's a channel that I've been following and I really love listening to it, Stand Firm Productions, that features Father Joshua Waltz a lot. He's a Catholic priest of the Diocese of Bismarck, North Dakota. Anyway, there's something that Father Waltz said in one particular video that I think you'll find interesting. The way he describes exorcism is not how typical exorcists would, and I don't think he's an exorcist, but rather merely assisting the exorcists. It was crazy. Stuff's breaking there's all this just commotion all of a sudden this guy comes in he like opens the door he's like father he's just covered in sweat he's like can you help us and i'm like what's going on they're like we're doing an exorcism we can't hold her down <clears throat> so i'm like okay whatever you know so i come in and she's just sitting there you know and i'm like what what's the deal she's very calm at this point and then they, they, they're just like, stand by her and get ready. And I'm like, okay. And then he starts praying the prayers of exorcism. This woman is like, I don't know, she's in her mid-60s. She's got to be, I don't know, a buck ten, maybe. And she is uncontrollable. Like, I had her in a double chicken wing. Like, I got, she stood up at her double chicken wing. Like, I thought it, several times I was going to break her shoulders because I was, I was lifting up so hard to subdue her. At one point, she was on the ground. We had, there were, there were five grown men holding her down. She picked a guy up and threw him, okay? So, like, you're seeing extraordinary stuff. And it, as I'm holding there, you know, and, and, and then it was so amazing. This is where, you know, Nefarious comes in. I'd be just cranking her. She's sc screaming, spitting. And then all of a sudden, she, it'd switch. And she's like, she like, look up at me. And she's like, please let me go. It hurts. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, F you, you know, and I'm just like, okay, you know, like, it was, it was, it was not, I just want to, I want to hammer something home. It was not scary at all. Not scary at all. It was so flippin' sad, you guys. I was brought to tears numerous times during this exorcism. At one point, as they're, as, as they're, you know, exercising the person, she, like, wrenches in a position I've never seen before, like, bent backwards, and just, like, starts coughing and then breathes 
and the like this exhale in the whole room smells like alcohol. And I'm like, what the hell was that? And they're like, and the the ex is like, that's the demon of alcohol. Alcoholism is expelled. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like, oh, how many demons are in here? I don't, I don't know, you know. So it went on for like an hour. By the end of it, she just kind of went limp, almost looked dead, and uh, and came to, and she's like, where am I? She had no recollection of any of it, any of it. Did you know that demons hate hell? Well, according to Monsignor Rossetti, he said the demons want to hold on to their possessed people. Over and over again during an exorcism, they complain and say they don't want to leave. This usually reminded Monsignor Rossetti of the legion demons that begged Jesus, while he was exorcising them, that they might enter the pigs. Apparently, they don't want to go back to hell. However, Father Rossetti also recalls that hell is the place that they themselves created. And he affirms this because of a well-known fact among exorcists that occurred during a session. The priest was ordering the demons back to hell, the place he said God had made for them, but the demon replied, God did not create hell. He would never have thought of such a place. We did it. That is why hell is so horrible. It was made by demons. Father Rossetti also points out that in the course of an exorcism, it is often very difficult to expel the demons because they cling tenaciously. In his experience, but also that of any exorcist who has dealt with serious cases, demons will try every trick in the book to stay. They will hide and make the exorcists think they are gone. They will try to prevent the possessed from attending the sessions. In the sessions themselves, they will beg and plead, or conversely, they will act as if nothing bothers them. One of the demons' favorite phrases is, we will never leave, but of course, they don't have any choice in it because they do leave eventually. Demons act like desperate beasts that face their own destruction. They will shake and scream. Monsignor Rossetti once said that he can still hear the words of Lucifer himself when he was personally expelled by the Virgin Mary. He yelled a long no three times before he left. Lucifer and his minions themselves, not God, made hell. It is an indescribably horrible place. The demons do everything they can to avoid coming back. Since some of you requested that I share prayer sessions with Monsignor Rossetti in previous video, I'll place this one here for the last part of this video, which is in casting out evil spirits from our lives. Let's take a moment to listen to him and join the prayer. By the way, every audio clip shared in this video and also other videos for that matter, you can always find the links to the original videos in the description box down below. For this prayer, we're going to be casting out any evil influences, evil spirits in our lives. First, let me say a protection prayer for all of us. May the Blessed Mother of Jesus spread her mantle of protection over all of us. May the holy angels surround us and protect us. May the blood of Jesus wash over us and fill us, healing us, protecting us, making us holy. So, most of the time when we have physical illnesses and psychological illnesses, of course, we should see medical doctors or psychologists or whatever is appropriate for the natural healing means. But sometimes there are indeed evil spirits which can affect us physically, psychologically, and of course, uh, spiritually. So what I'd like to do now is ask each of you to think about some aspect of your life which you'd like to have some deliverance for. Could be a deliverance from the spirits of infirmity, of constant illnesses, uh, depressions, fears, anxieties, compulsions, uh, pornography addictions, other kind of sexual problems, uh, even uh, constant financial problems, any sort of constant uh, area where you think you could use some deliverance and healing for. So get those uh, areas in your mind and we'll be praying for those in a moment. Now one thing I would say is that each of us has authority over our own bodies, our own lives. So we can command evil spirits and demons to leave us. You know, we can say in the holy name of Jesus, I command these evil spirits to leave us, which is fine. Now, we do not have that authority, most people don't, over other people, such as neighbors or friends or whatever. So, but for this prayer, we're going to have you command the demons to leave your life. So, repeat after me. In the holy name of Jesus, in the holy name of Jesus, I command the evil spirits to leave me. I command the evil spirits to leave me. The evil spirits of... And now name them. In the holy name of Jesus, in the holy name of Jesus, I reject them, I rebuke them, I renounce them. 
I reject them, I rebuke them, I renounce them, and I cast them out, and I cast them out. In the holy name of Jesus, in the holy name of Jesus, I rebuke them, and I cast them out. In the holy name of Jesus, I rebuke them and cast them out. In Jesus' name, I reject them and cast them out. In Jesus' name, I reject them and cast them out. Now, I'd like to say a prayer over all of you. In the holy name of Jesus, I evoke the authority of the church now. And I command these evil spirits to leave you, spirits that you have mentioned, and any evil spirits of depression, anxiety, and fear, of hopelessness, despair, suicidality, sexual addictions, pornography addictions, compulsions, alcoholism, uh, sexual problems, relationship problems, chaos, financial problems. In the holy name of Jesus, I rebuke these spirits, I reject these spirits, and I reject all evil spirits that are affecting you and your loved ones. In Jesus' name, I cast them out. In the holy name of Jesus, I cast them out. Now I'm going to say a short healing prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that the healing power of Christ, the blood of Jesus, might wash over each person, washing over their hearts, their minds, resting their minds in you, resting their hearts in you, healing, purifying, and sanctifying. In the name of Jesus, may you all be healed. In the name of Jesus, may you be liberated and at peace. And may God bless you. Well, that's all for this time. I hope that you'll find something useful and you've learned something beneficial for your own spiritual warfare here with us today. For those of you who'd like to support our works and your contribution helps us, especially with the visual aids used for all our videos, which currently we're using Motion Array and Adobe Image Assets mostly, I left the link to our PayPal donation down in the description box below. Thank you so much to all of you who have donated before, especially Chris Corton, Sergio Garza, Lukas Juicki, Fred Bolton, Donna Merrill, Matt Mead, John Elmore, Tulio Amorum, and Maria Tomas for your continuous support and encouragement. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your names correctly. Well then, until the next video, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you. Evil is sadness. Like, the more you get into it, the more despair you get. And what the devil wants more than anything, and this is a beautiful line in Nefarious when he says, he's like, we want you alone. We want you to feel the loneliness of being detached from God. And the way we do that is through sin. And the further you get into sin, the lonelier you get, the more despair you get. End game, man. That's the devil's whole game. He does not give two craps about hiding in your closet and pretending to be the boogeyman to scare you at night. He could give, that's why like horror movies are so dumb or like hiding under your bed and he's going to reach up and grab. Devil doesn't do that. He doesn't care about that. What he cares about is every choice you make. Every choice you make is turning you in to a saint or a demon. And it's up to you. You call the shots.